In today's rapidly changing world, we all have questions and we all want answers. It's on this program that we get our answers from the Word of God. It's time for another episode of A Relevant Word with longtime pastor and best selling author Carl Gallup. This is A Relevant Word with Pastor Carl Gallops of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in the Pensacola, Florida area. And today we're going to talk about the return of the Lord. Yeah. So many different ways and people think of different ways, but I'm... I'm different looking, interpretations. I'm looking forward word, to yeah. hearing you turn this into today's relevant word. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I am going to be. Now, of course, this can be a controversial topic, so I want to be as gracious and as humble about this as I can be. So... You know, for those that get into this uh, and 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 they've been brought up in certain traditions of understanding of the scriptures on when will the Lord return, you understand the terms like, well, is it going to be pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation or post-tribulation? That's after the tribulation. I'll explain what those mean very quickly here in a minute. But I, I'm I'm going to tell you where I stand. But I'm also willing to say, look, I could be wrong. Uh, but but what I'm going to show you from the scriptures, though, is compelling. And I'm not here to change your mind or to cram anything down your throat. What I'm going to show you is Jesus answers the question. And I know some people say, well, that could just be your interpretation. Uh, no, not in this case. Two different times, two different places, he says the same things. And he says, it will be just like this. And I will quote those to you in a moment. But folks, when Jesus says... The return of the Son of Man will be just like this. And then he tells you what that like this is. And the word is just like. It's not kind of like, sort of like, might be like, well, it's going to be similar to. No, it's just like this. And what he says is found all through the Bible. Uh, You know, when he says just like this, that this is that he talks about is all through the Bible. I I know I'm speaking a little cryptically right now. I'll clean all this up in a moment, but I just want you to know from the outset, don't turn the dial. If you think, if you're thinking something like, oh my gosh, I I know where he's standing. He doesn't stand where I stand. I don't want to hear this. I I, listen, I'm not going to be crazy about this. I'm just going to answer the question. And it's a good question you've asked Kevin, because people ask it all the time. There are myriad of books written to all the different views and everything. And again, I'm not here to cram a specific view down people's face. I just want you to hear clearly what Jesus said, okay? So again, for those that are new to all of this terminology, the words, um, the word tribulation is in the Bible and in in the King James and some of the older versions, you'll see that actual word. It's kind of an archaic word. We don't use the word tribulation in our daily speech. I, I, I can't think of the last time I've come in and told my wife, man, I had such tribulation today. No, the, the word just it means trouble. It means anxiety. It means uh, just, you know, just uh, horrible times, pressing times. But, but it's, it's an older word, tribulation. But as I said, the older translations and even some of the newer ones still keep that term because it's come to mean something very theological. So the word is tribulation. And and then, you know, pre-tribulation rapture, the word rapture, people say, well, there, there's no rapture in the Bible. You don't even find that word. Well, you do in the Latin version, okay? In the Greek in which it's written, the word is thlipsis. And, uh, excuse me, no, that's, that's for tribulation. The, the word is um, uh, harpazo in the Greek. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and so, but it means a catching away, a taking up, a taking out of the way. And that's where the Latin term uh, rapture, that means the same thing. And so that made its way into a lot of English versions or, or English translations. And so that's why you'll hear somebody talk about the rapture, the rapture this, the rapture that. And then people say, well, it's not in the Bible. That word's not even there. Well, but the concept is, the idea is, it's just a matter of you using Greek or using English or are you using Latin. Okay, so let's just clear all that up. Yes, the teaching is there that at the blowing of the last trumpet, at the blowing of the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, verse 51, 52, 53, at the last trumpet, okay, we will be caught up, we will be caught away. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's there. Matthew 24, Jesus said, the Son of Man will call to his angels from one end of the corner to the other. They'll gather the elect at the sound of a loud shout and a trumpet blast, okay, and they'll gather them together. So the idea of a rapture is in the Bible. Now, so we get down to, well, 
tribulation. All right, so there's going to be seven years of tribulation before the Lord comes, right, Carl? Well, it, the Bible does seem to say that. You get that from the book of Daniel. I'm trying not to be too complex because I want to get right to the to the point here. But the point is that um, you do seem to have it, – it does seem very clearly to say that there's a time when the, when the tribulation gets pretty rough, worse and worse and worse and worse. Then the Lord comes, gathers up his elect, etc. But there, the three main – versions of how to interpret the timing of the Lord's coming. And nobody knows the day or the hour. And I'm not a date setter. I don't do that either. But it is it pre-tribulation. That means does he come before the time of that those last seven years? Or is it mid-tribulation? Does he come right in the middle of that after about three and a half years? Or is it post, that is after or near the end of that time of tribulation? Is that when he comes? So those are the three big arguments of the world. And all of the all of the uh, polls that have been taking, taken by um, by the Pew poll and, and, and the Barna poll and all these polling groups that, that poll religious thought in, in America and around the world, they all say that those three groups are broken down at about 33% each. In other words, uh, it's almost even about 33% of the church believes one, 33% of the church believes another three. Well, we can't all be right, you know, and you mean 66% of the church is wrong and only 33% get this one thing? I don't know. I'm just going to tell you what Jesus says, and I'm going to break this down and get it real, real clear for you, because I really don't care what the books and the PowerPoints and the novels and the movies say about it. I really don't. I really don't even care about what, well, my preacher said, well, my granddaddy said, well, my mama said, well, my dad. Okay, I mean, I I, I love your mama, your daddy, your preacher, your brother, and, and all my people, too, and all the preachers I've heard. That's not a question with me. It's just that I want to know what Jesus says. That's it. It's as simple as that. So again, I'm not being mean about this. And if you believe something other than I do, for those of you that when you hear this and you see where I stand, you're going to be pumping your fist in the air and cheering and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, somebody's speaking this. But and for those of you, know, if you're listening right now and you don't, please hear me. I'm not trying to cram this down your throat. I just want you to know what Jesus said and then let's examine it together. Okay. So here's the deal. In Luke 17 and Matthew 24, Jesus answers the question directly. He's asked, tell us about the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, Matthew 24, he's speaking. Well, let me back up and do Luke 17 because that's that's the order that it comes in. In Luke 17, Jesus is on his way to the cross, but he started way up in the Lake Galilee area. He's coming down the Jordan Road. Then he's going to go up through Jericho. He's going to wind up on the Mount of Olives. From there, he's going to come through the Eastern Gate and into Jerusalem, okay? So that trip will take him a couple of months. It, it, it wouldn't normally if you just went straight there, but they're stopping village by village, and they're spending days, and sometimes the Pharisees will come out because each village has a synagogue, and the Pharisees kind of run the synagogues, and so so he's talking, teaching, preaching, but he's on his way to the cross, He's on his way. It's almost Passover. It's springtime now. We're getting early spring. So he's making his way. And so in Luke 17, we find him on the Jordan River Road. He comes across a village, and the Pharisees come out. And they're talking. Most of the Pharisees at this point are are dead set against Jesus. Not all of them, but most of them, because he's kind of considered a religious troublemaker now. He's been around the area for three years. He's worked miracles. He's got crowds of tens of thousands that show up sometimes when he preaches. Uh, the, the Pharisees have never had a crowd like that. I mean, a couple of hundred maybe, you know. So they're jealous. They're mad. Uh, he says things that upsets their apple cart, um, you, you know. And so here he comes, and he's coming near one of the villages, an entourage of Pharisees Pharisees come out, and they're talking to him. In the midst of the conversation, one of the Pharisees asks, and I write about this in my book, Glimpses of Glory. It's like written like a novel, so you're there when it happens. You're there when the Pharisees come out. It's a novel format. And they come out and they ask him, so tell us. We've been listening to you talking about the coming of the kingdom of God. So tell us, what will be the signs? What will be the signs of the coming of the Son of Man? That term, Son of Man, is a Hebraic messianic term, the Messiah. In other words, what what are going to be the signs? How are we going to know? When the kingdom of God comes, how will we know? This was Jesus' answer to them. 
I'm going to paraphrase it, but I'm using his exact words. But by, by paraphrase, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm just shortening the whole thing because it's about six paragraphs. But he says, "The coming of the Son of Man will be just like it was in the days of Noah." And then he says, "And it will be just like it was in the days of Lot." the coming of the Son of Man. Again, not kind of like, not similar to, not sort of like, not here's an example or here's something you can kind of compare it to. No, he was clear. He was emphatic. It will be just like the days of Noah, just like the days of Lot. That's pretty clear. Now you move on down the road a few months and he comes to Jerusalem. They're up on top of the Mount of Olives. They're on the side of the hill. They're looking down upon the city of Jerusalem. The disciples comment to him, look how beautiful that Temple Mount is. Ba, 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 ba. Look how gorgeous. It's just beautiful, isn't it? And Jesus said, you know what? I tell you the truth, not one stone is going to be left upon another. And they say, what? That would be like if before September 11th in 2001, that horrible thing, if a couple of months before somebody said, you know what? Those two towers are going to be down in a couple of months. Something horrible is going to happen. They're going to be gone. People would go, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. What are you talking about? That temple represented that to those people. That had been around for a long time. That was their pride and joy. And there it was, and Jesus said, it's going to be gone. But then they said, tell us about it. Tell us. And then they said, and tell us about the coming of the Son of Man. When will these things happen? Tell us. And one of the things he said that day was, it'll be just like the days of Noah. He tells them the same thing. When we come back after the break, I'll get into exactly what he meant when he said, just like those days. He said it twice in just a few days. This is Irrelevant Words with Pastor Carl Gallops. We'll return right after the break. For more on Pastor Carl or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. For more on Pastor Carl or to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. This is a relevant word with Pastor Carl Gallops. I'm Kevin King. Now, Pastor, we're talking about the return of the Lord, yeah. but we're talking very specifically yes, we are. about the return Which can of be the controversial, Lord. but I, I'm, I'm being nice. Yes. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Only It's only what Jesus said. <laughs> well, so it's only what Jesus said. That's right. And in just a moment, I'm going to read from the church fathers for the first 300 years what they said. And uh, so between what Jesus said and what they said, then here we are. So, yeah. And, and so if you, you know... You, you just have come back from listening to the first segment, so you know where we've left off. And the point is, listen, I'm going to just tell you right up front. I, I personally hold more to what would be called the, the um, historic premillennial view. Now, those are theological terms, but I'm going to use it because I'm going to read a portion as a paragraph or two from a book of a very, very famous um, pre-tribulation rapture author who happens to be a friend of mine. I've been on his television shows many times. He knows that I have a different view from him because I do not have the pre-tribulation view. And for those of you listening, please don't turn the radio off. I'm not teaching heresy. I'm going to get into what Jesus said, and we're going to examine it, okay? I want you to think with me for a few moments. But I'm also going to tell you what this gentleman, David Reagan, Dr. David Reagan, uh, the head of Lamb Lion Ministries. Again, I've been on his TV shows many times. We've had I, I, I preached a conference for him in Dallas one time, a huge conference. And uh, I was invited by him, invited back to preach another one by him. So I'm just telling you, I'm not just pulling this stuff out of my back pocket. I know what I'm talking about, okay? Now, so the historic premillennial view says basically that the, that the coming of the Lord is 
is it coincides with the rapture of the church. We know there's the rapture, three different chapters. Actually, there's four places in the Bible. There's even one of them, the book of Revelation, that talks about it. That's another show, though. But the three that I've already quoted to you, 1 Corinthians 15 and, and 1 Thessalonians 4 and Matthew 24, where it talks about the rapture and the trumpet sound and the shout from heaven and the calling of those on the earth that are still left or ca- caught up in the clouds and sky and et cetera, et cetera. That's the rapture of the church. Well, the, the historic premillennial view says that comes sometime sh- at, at about the same time the Lord is returning. So it comes at sometime near the end of this period of tribulation that, that the earth is just going to go crazier and crazier and crazier. But in the meantime, God takes care of his people, and there's a promise. Peter talks about that. We'll get to that in just a moment. But I just want you to know why I stand there, and, and here's why. Now, Dr. David Reagan wrote this in his book called Wrath and Glory, page 112 and 113. Again, he's a friend of mine. I've been on his shows. I've preached at his conferences. So I'm not just picking up a book and trashing somebody. I'm just telling you what they said in their book. He says, quote, the oldest viewpoint about the doctrine of the rapture is called historic premillennialism or post-tribulation. It is termed historic for two reasons. Number one, to differentiate it from modern premillennialism, that would be pre-tribulation, and to indicate that Listen to this. It was the historic position of the early church. This view is based on a literal interpretation of what the Bible says, and I'm going to add the words, and what Jesus says, (laughs) will happen in the end times. One of its distinctive features is that it places the rapture of the church at the end of the tribulation, combining it with the second coming as one event, end quote. That comes from Dr. Reagan's book, Wrath and Glory, page 112 and 113. Then listen to what else he says, quote, this is the only systematic view of end-time events that existed during the first 300 years of church history. Now, that's important, and I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. But first, let's get back to what Jesus said. Then I want to end the program with telling you why it's important what he just said. The only view it was the only view, and this comes from the, the world's premier pre-trib teacher and author to this day, Dr. David Reagan. And he says that. He admits that, that for the first 300 years, that was the only view taught. What view is that? Well, what I'm teaching you. Where did you get it from, Carl? I got it from Jesus. Because Jesus says in Luke 17 and Matthew 24, the last days are going to be just like the coming of the, of, of the Son of Man. It's going to be just like the days of Noah and just like the days of Lot. So we're going to go back and look at those days. But remember, Dr. David Reagan says that not only was this the preeminent view, but he says it was based on the literal interpretation of what the Bible says. He says that in his book. So please, again, I'm not pulling this out of my back pocket. I'm not trying to make you believe what I believe. I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm just, I want to stick with the Bible. That's always been my theme of life around the Word of God is I really don't care what the books, the novels, the movies, the PowerPoints, the the preachers and teachers say, unless they measure it through what Jesus said. Jesus is the one I have to answer to. He's the one you have to answer to. That's all I care about. What did Jesus say? And that's where I'm going to stand. Now, if you choose to take a different path, that's up to you. But hear this out, okay? Just like the days of Noah, just like the days of Lot. That's interesting. We know a lot about the days of Noah, starting in in, uh, Genesis chapter 6. Well, actually, a little before. But in Genesis chapter 6, it talks about a demonic outpouring, the sons of God. That's another word for angels that are fallen, have come and came unto the daughters of men, and then had children by them, and there were giants in the land, and there was terror for filled the land. And and then it goes on to say, God says, and everything they thought they could do, they did. And then it goes on to say, and all flesh became corrupt. That, that, that included animal flesh as well as human flesh. Some translations say, and all human flesh became corrupt, but that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says all flesh. And we know that's true because what was on the ark? Just humans? No, there were animals too. So what was God doing? He was preserving the flesh that was not corrupt. How do we know that? Because that's what he said. Noah and his family were the only righteous ones. And then he told Noah, you go, you build this ark, and I will bring the animals to you. And when you get down to the last week before the floods came, God tells Noah, now go into the ark. And what he's saying is move out of your house. They'd been living in their house. Noah had been building the ark for 120 years, getting it ready. Not a single animal had they gone out and found. They didn't know which ones were not corrupted. Only God knew which DNA was not corrupted. He knew. 
And the Bible says that God said, move out of your house one week from today. The floods will come. Now, he didn't give Noah the hour, but he gave him the day. But he gave him the day only one week before it happened. He said, move out of your house, move into the ark. The ark apparently had some like a living room, some bedrooms. It had a little house in it for the, his family, but then it had all these cages and all these stalls, everything ready. He said, move in, and then the rains will come. So, it, so it, it went seven days. So some people will look at that and say, well, see, that represents the rapture. I mean, because now they're taken out of the way, and now they're protected, but that's not keep reading the Bible. They, God brought the animals. It says four different times. It says, no, three different times. It says, and God brought the animals to them. God brought the animals to them. God brought the animals to them. So what did Noah and his family do? They were in and out of that ark all day, every day, rounding up the animals, getting them inside, getting them into the cages, getting them in. They, they weren't hiding. They weren't there behind closed doors. The doors were opened. The Bible says that the doors only closed at the hand of God. God closed the doors right after the flood started. It doesn't say Noah shut them. He didn't. It says God shut them. God brought the animals. Why did God bring the animals? He knew which ones were not corrupted. He knew which family was not corrupted. Noah and his family represents the church of the last days, if you will, Jew and Gentile, believers in Jesus Christ, who have not corrupted themselves in the ways of this world, and they have been put. They are under the blood of Christ. They will be raptured. That's what the ark and the flood is about. It's a picture of being lifted up above the wrath of God that comes down upon the earth. God pushed the reset button. He destroyed every living thing except for what he put on the ark. That which flesh was not corrupted. So Noah and his family lived in the midst of the worst times the world had ever seen, yet they were protected. He would stand on that ark. He would preach to people. He had to go into town to buy nails, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I mean, he, he, he had to go buy some things and do some things. Same thing with Lot in Lot's day. The, the angels came to Abraham. There were three of them. Then you find out one of them was the Lord himself in the flesh. That's what we call a theophany or a Christophany. There he was. Then two of them left. They went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And, but he went to Lot's house, the only ones there that weren't corrupted. In fact, Lot was trying to beat people off this house because they were trying to have uh, marital relations, if you will, <laughs> with, with the, the men who, who were angels, but they didn't know that. They looked like men that had shown up at his front door. And then Lot was just bereaved in his heart. But then the angels took Lot and his family out. There's a picture of the rapture. Again, took them out. When? Right before the wrath of God came. Okay? He took them out. He took Noah out right before the wrath. He took Lot out right before the wrath. But what does Peter write about this in First and Second Peter? I'm going to paraphrase it, but here's what he says. He says, if God knew how to take angels in the days of Noah, and put them in dark dungeons because they stepped out of their boundaries. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it says. If he knew how to do that, and if he knew how to take care of uh, Noah, a preacher of righteousness in his day and his family, and if he knew how to take care of Peter, a man who was crushed in his heart, looking at the wickedness of the world around him, and if he knew how to do that, won't he know how to take care of you in the last days? So the whole thing is, I tell people, look, I could be wrong, but but Jesus says it so clearly, and he tells us what to look at, and when you look at it, there's the pattern, and it just doesn't fit a lot of what's being taught in the churches today. I don't care what's being taught. I mean, your pastor may be awesome, the, the, the denomination you're in may be awesome, maybe some lovely, lovely people, but when it comes to stuff like this, I want to know what Jesus says in context, in the Word. I want to know what the Word says. And that is as clear as it gets. It will be just like the days of Noah, just like the days of Lot. And Peter writes about the days of Noah, days of Lot. He says it'll be just like that. Don't fret. God's got this. He knows how to take care of you. And here we are. And I tell, Kevin, I tell God's people today, even today, who who listen to this, say, well, I was taught we were going to be taken out before anything bad happens. Look, something bad is always happening. Mm -hmm. Always. I say, keep your eyes on Jesus. Pay the bills, mow the grass, plan for the future, but keep your eyes on Jesus. He's got this like he did with Noah, like he did with Lot. Our world's going out of its mind, but we belong to Jesus. Jesus doesn't say Christians will be taken out before the bad happens. Yeah, the bad has been happening since the days of the flood and since the rebuilding of the earth, and it's gotten worse and worse and worse, and it's going to continue to happen. And Jesus said, in this day, you in, in this world, you will have tribulation. But... First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, but you 
God's people have not been appointed to suffer the wrath of God. In other words, we will be taken out before God pours out his wrath. And that's what the days of Noah and the days of Lot illustrate. And that's what Jesus said. And that is comforting. It is, because I just get on with life. I see the world falling apart all around me, but I just keep living for Jesus. This is Irrelevant Words with Pastor Carl Gallops. Yeah, thank you so much for listening today. May the Lord bless you and keep you always. Now more than ever, we need to listen to God. He still speaks through His Word, the Bible. Each week, Pastor Gallops shares what the Word of God is saying, even now. A Relevant Word with longtime pastor and best-selling author Carl Gallops. To access Pastor Carl and to listen to his podcast anytime, visit carlgallops.com. Thanks for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author Pastor Carl Gallops, The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallops takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and, you know, you speak of, for example, Internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.